NTV. Good morning and welcome to Everyday Life on this 22nd day of the month of January in 2018. The month is really moving fast, so you probably have, you know, laid down your strategy and you are sure that you'll probably achieve or maybe hope to, you know, achieve the goals that you've set uh, from the previous year. Now, today we're going to look at a legacy of a very good man and, you know, a leader in the religious circles, uh, the late Nkoyoyo. He passed away, but then, you know, there are a number of people and a number of, you know, good Ugandans who are trying to keep up his legacy. You know, this uh, man of God had put up schools, he had put up very many things, you know, you know, to try and cater for the other people. And that is what we're going to talk about. But before we head into the discussion, uh, we did a story about a school that was set up by the Latin Koyoyo. And just take a look at this story. Nkoyoyo boarding primary school located in Buyukwe district stands out as part of the legacy of the late retired Archbishop of Uganda, Livingstone Impala Nkoyoyo. <laughs> the school, which is commonly called Matale, after the village in which it is located, was established in 1957 as a girls' boarding school. It was later turned into a mixed school in 1961. Nkoyoyo oversaw the success of the school between 1960 and early 1990s. In fact, we have lost a father, an advisor, a counselor, and uh, in fact, mostly those three things. However, ever since the school's administration was handed over to government under the Universal Primary Education Arrangement, the school's standards suddenly started dropping and it is now just a shadow of its former self. Many of the school's buildings have been abandoned after they began developing cracks from years of neglect. A number of buildings have no roofs, and part of the compound has been turned into a grazing ground for livestock. Tony Makubuya, an old student of Matali between 1974 and 1976, recalls the glorious days of the school. The Abebiti, Abagaga, Makinawa, Bomboka, Junji Motors, Bonava, Bajanga one. Natia Swan to Liba two, Kavita one Abana Governor, Banyanga, Vacha Kik, Mumbaguami, or Nabajanga one, Bazukla Abana. This structure used to be the dining hall for pupils here in the 70s, 80s and early 90s. But as you can see, it is now in a solid state and condemned with pupils no longer using it. The buildings are old. That is the matter, you know. They are old. And as you see, those ones which you are seeing that at least they are presentable are the ones we renovated. This situation has seen the enrollment levels reduced from 3,000 pupils in 1990s to 700 by 2017, as the people's academic performance continued on a downward spiral. 2015, when I came, we got 33 first grades. 2016, the performance deteriorated a bit. We got very few first grades. So this year, we're expecting more. So performance cannot just come in air. No, it is through hard work and teamwork, and also the welfare. Tony Katamba, the chairperson of Nkoyoyo Boarding Old Students Association, says the church and parents neglected the school after government introduced universal primary education. Uh, the association has uh, already committed to the diocese, to Mukono Diocese, that they are going to pay the next headmaster, wherever he's, he, he comes from, and then we will also facilitate in trying to get some of the best teachers. In memory of letting Koyoyo, the school administrators have appealed to government and the old pupils to work towards the renovation of the school. Uh, it has so many cracks. So if we can put up a new structure and maybe decide of the main hall, at least it is okay, it can be renovated. We even put a signpost 
strong signpost which can, at least everybody who passes by, will really remember that this is the foundation of Bishop Nkoyo. Because he's the, found, he's the founder. Away from Nkoyo boarding primary school, Nkoyo has left other projects, such as Martin Nkoyo inclusive primary school in Nakabagomokono flourishing. Hubbard Ziwa, NTV. <music>Welcome back. This is Everyday Life on the 22nd day of January. Now, in studio, I have Chakwa Namitala Doris, uh, the treasurer of Matali Old Students Association, and a colleague, you know, in another place, but here is sitting in as the chairperson of Matali Old Students Association. From that story, we can, you know, pick out that uh, the legacy of the school, you know, was a strong one from the foundation from back in the days. Uh, but what I noticed was that it was a girls' school initially. And I want us to start at that point. Is it still a girls' school? Because I have Tony Katamba as the head of the association. Um, thank you very much, Walter. Uh, good morning, viewers. The school uh, started in the 50s as a girls' school but it advanced to a mixed school in the 60s uh, before it became actually one of the best schools in the country uh, through the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. Yeah. All right. And, you know, to put this whole thing into context about the legacy of good schools in the country, you know, this is not just an isolated case, but I also did a story previously about Nyapea, you know, in northern Uganda and this is a school that was also ranked as one of the best yeah. and also you know came down crumbling you know and it's a you know religion based school yeah. but issues of mismanagement and probably even you know lack of support from the government yeah. they are trying to revive that school as we talk now but yeah. what we want to hear <coughs> from you about this particular school is what plans do you have, Doris? Uh, thank you, Walter. Good morning, viewers. Um, the plans we have for this school, apparently we are trying to recruit a new headmaster that we feel will manage the school. Uh, he was initially our former teacher, and we thought that uh, when we bring that person on board, he'll be able to put this back to glory. He has a plan. He has, uh, he has narrated to us uh, the mechanisms that he's going to use to ensure that this school comes back to its glory. With the help of the church, since it is a founded, uh, a school that is founded by the church, plus the old students. Okay. And, you know, we cannot probably have solutions if we do not understand where the problems yeah. originated. Yeah. What basically happened, you know, to Nkoyo, your school? Um, thank you very much, Walter. Now, what, uh, uh, from the diagnosis that we've been doing for a while now, uh, what really happened to most of these schools was that the people, we, the parents that used to be heavily involved in the running of these schools, pulled out when people said UPE. And in the scramble for privatization, several schools came up, uh, you know, several private schools came up around uh, the urban centers. So what parents did, because the, these uh, apparently right now a little more money in their pockets, they did not care that at one point maybe the economy would, you know, be better uh, in terms of structures and then the right money would be coming to their pocket. So they ran to these private schools and abandoned those schools. Reason being, the private schools did their homework and added a little few things to the things that they give out in their systems. You know, you have private schools taking kids for swimming. You have private schools giving sodas on lunch. You have private schools. And these are things that were not heard of. Yeah. So what happened is we, the parents, abandoned these schools. But we forgot that there are other schools that were so set up on the right foundations. 
because uh, maybe one thing we didn't mention it is that this is a church founded school yeah uh, the land was given free of charge by the late Erisa Nkoyoyo who is a father to the late bishop now the late archbishop Nkoyoyo and you had people willing to give out free land to educate communities wherever they are and this school was set up on a vast piece of land with all sorts of facilities that you would never come across in these, uh, you know, urban private schools. So, so the onus now is on the public to realize that maybe those schools gave a lot better in terms of raising children for the future, in terms of grooming children for the future. And so the onus is on us to now go back and revive those schools because with these urban-centered schools, only urban people can go there. First of all, they are too expensive. Mm. And then two, uh, they are not really set up as proper schools. I mean, you have schools where people, pl where kids play in classrooms because they don't have spaces to play. And these are the kind of schools we are taking our children to. Um, um, I think that we need to realize that the schools with the right foundations, with the right values need to be protected and need to be kept safe for the future of our country and our children. All right. In terms of, you know, numbers, because I think the numbers is what builds a school. Uh, if we're looking at, you know, good schools and those good old schools, uh, King College, Budo, yeah. you know, SMAC, they have big numbers in terms of students. How are we going to make sure that, you know, we can still recall or, you know, pull those numbers Mm -hmm. to strengthen our school again? Uh, uh, may I respond before you submit? Oh. Um, I think that it is very simple. Number one, we take our children to schools because they, are, they have the right values. They are teaching the right values to our children. And number two, because they are, they are good academics. And the welfare is not too bad. Well, welfare comes afterwards, um, especially if you're considering comparing private and these other schools. But the key thing is that we have set up to revive the academics of that school. And that's something that we have done with the founding bodies because remember, this is not our school. Mm -hmm. It's a church-founded school. Mm -hmm. And so whatever you do, you have to go back to the church and consult and, and, and agree. And also with government because it's government aided, it's church founded, government aided. So we, we cannot do things in isolation and this is why it's a, it's a patient process because whatever we do, we have to consult, but we have moved on the areas that we have agreed we should move as an association and we have uh, uh, identified in consultation with the church, we have identified the best the person we think is the best to revive the academics, who was actually a teacher at that school in its glory days. And then we have also uh, decided to support in terms of, uh, uh, you know, topping up on good teachers' salaries because this is a village. If you're taking someone there, they are going to be, you know, they are going to need to be able to be there comfortably. So again, we are coming in slowly, but as we come in, we are again cognizant of the fact that this is not our school, and so we have to do it together with the, the founding bodies and other stakeholders so that we do not clash because we know that's the, uh, uh, the best foundation that we can set up for the school. Right, Doris, do you want to add a voice? Uh, about the numbers, maybe if I can add on what Tony is saying. Uh, I, I believe we can accommodate the numbers because this is a well-established school. Mm. It has a lot of land and all the facilities are there. It's only because these facilities have been turned into, oh, they are old, they have replenished, something like that. Mm. But I think we can accommodate the numbers if the f welfare is okay, uh, if the academics can improve, I think we can manage. Okay. I can only pick examples from uh, a story that I did still, I'll refer to it in your pair, uh, where there was, you know, mismanagement and pulling of strings between uh, the original church foundation that set up the school and the government, you know. Mm -hmm. There is a certain way that the church 
wants its things to be done. And this was not in conformity with the government, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, providing certain teachers to teach yeah. religion. Yeah. And this was one of the reasons why that school particularly broke down, you know, uh, including many other things, mismanagement of funds. Mm. What's your relationship with the government? I, I would ask you because you're the, you know, association mm. members, and I'm very certain that you probably have all this info gathered by now. Yeah. We have, um, uh, first of all, let me mention that in trying to even get the headmaster I talked about, we have been working with government because you know you can't just pick someone and take to a government school. So uh, our relationship is close, but uh, on mentioning that, I also need to mention that government is a little bit slow in executing its things. And this is where the challenge is. They have their processes and you cannot jump them. I can tell you for a fact that we went to the diocese and the diocese bought into us helping on bringing a headmaster over a year ago. But up until today, that, that headmaster has not been appointed. Reason? It's the government processes. And we are waiting. And the, to, the fact is we cannot skip government processes. We have to work hand in hand. Sometimes they are too slow for our liking. But, I mean, they are the critical stakeholders and you, ca you have to respect the processes and then go through. But um, uh, I don't know about the clashing of the church and the government, but sometimes, sometimes the government moves a little too slow for, for certain things. But again, it, it is everything has to be managed. And so that process is managed and we respect the government mm -hmm. and we respect what they're doing. Uh, even though we, we, we do not believe that it has to be that slow, but well, everyone has a job to do and we would like to respect that. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, but we, that said, we are very happy with the church okay. because they were very swift, swift in, in, in terms of moving. They were very swift when we came in and said we wanted to help. They were very swift to write to the to, 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 to Buyikwe district to give them instructions on what they thought should be done. And, and we are very happy with the way they are working. And if we work like this with the church, I think that we are going to form very, very strong foundations for that school so that we don't really slide back to where it is now. All right. Uh, the reconstruction process is going on. Like uh, you've been telling us, you started a process and which you hope that will be successful. But then, at the end of the day, how do we ensure that this process that we've started, probably we've gained success out of it, but how do we ensure that this school does not go through the same cycle again? Oh, thank you, Walter. To us, we think that uh, some of the reasons that led to the collapse of this school, mm. I think it was poor management, and maybe bringing in uh, universal primary education. We are thinking that if uh, we come up with a strong committee or board that is going to run this school, it's all about management. If we have a strong management team that can direct uh, this school, whenever something tries to di divert from our main vision or our main focus, then we can always put on board people who are capable of trying to put the school where we want it to be. Mm. Yes. Uh, may I add something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe just to, to add on to what she said. There are schools that are actually UPE that are really good today. Um, I'll take an example uh, of Budo Junior School. It, it, it kind of experienced what Matale has experienced, but the old students did not let it get as far as we got. Now, we are borrowing a leaf from those people because we are trying to ask them, how did you manage to keep it up? How did you manage to bring it back? And what we have done is we've gone in and found out that actually the Old Students uh, Association is a key component of the school management structure. And they keep monitoring because they always have representatives on the school management committee and they keep monitoring and they make sure they send there the right people. So what happens is you won't just pick, the, the, the government won't just pick any sort of headmaster and send to Budo Junior School. The, the headmaster will be vetted and they will make sure that the person that goes there has the right qualities 
for that kind of school. And so we would like to request the founding members to, 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 to be better represented on the school management committee so that we keep sending people who are interested in monitoring affairs of this school. And, and once we can do that, then the, the running of a school can be monitored on a, on a daily. And, and so we can't keep doing the wrong things. We can't keep taking the wrong headmasters. We can help when they need help. And so uh, going forward, we think that we are going to be a very critical part of the school management committee uh, because it is critical to monitor what goes on at the school. You know, headmasters are like leaders. Mm. They keep changing, and when they change, they come with different visions, different strategies, and sometimes the strategies they come with are not the best for a particular school. But once you have a nucleus that keeps you aligned to the vision and the strategy, then you will be told this is the direction we chose to take for reasons A, B, and C, and so you cannot digress from this direction. And that's what we are looking to do. All right. So yeah. if you have just joined us this morning, we are, you know, looking at reviving Nkoyoyo's legacy. And this is a man who was, uh, you know, the archbishop. And, you know, a few weeks ago, early this month, he did lost his life to uh, pneumonia, which is so unfortunate. But he did play his part and played his role. He put up many, many structures to see that he continues, you know, not just his legacy, but he also supports many other people. And this is including, you know, schools which uh, he set up in Buika District, that is uh, Nkoyoyo Boarding Primary School in Matali. And what we also know uh, from the association is that the school needs your help. It just does not need their help, but it needs your help. And if you are able to probably uh, give support, you can reach you know, to the members out here or you can probably go visit the school and see what you can do to help the school get back to its old self and you know, uh, be able to produce the future leaders of this country. It, it doesn't matter in you know, whatever category they will come out from. But what we also want to hear from, you know, Tony Katamba was the chairperson of Matali Old Students Association and Nami Taladoris, who are my guests today, is what is the relevance of keeping you know, such schools <coughs> alive? Because there are many schools coming up and you know, one would say that school is in Buikwe. After all, Buikwe, even you know, the PLE results were out. We didn't see it anywhere. So why do I need to ensure that this school keeps alive? Thank you. Thank you for that question, Walter. Sorry, Doris. I, it, it, is a sad, it is a sad question, but a very good one. Um, I can tell you that the days we went to school, we had an opportunity to go to first-class schools. I can tell you my parents were not the richest. Now, what these schools did was to give an opportunity to every Ugandan, wherever you were, to get a first class education. The private schools you're talking about, I don't know if you want to mention any and mention the school fees and tell me if the average Ugandan will be able to go and get a good education in those schools. You're probably talking over a million shillings. I'm not saying that if Matali restructures and has a, a fee structure that comes close to a million shillings, then it will be the same. But I am saying that Every other part of the country, be it Buikwe, the fact that they are getting five first grades does not mean we should just get them and they continue in that situation. We have the opportunity to access first class facilities. We have the responsibility to make sure that the future of Ugandans is better by giving them the same opportunity. I can tell you there are so many people who came from around that area and accessed that school when it was a first class school and they are now first class citizens. That school taught ministers, current ministers, they will not come out to say it, but there are so many. If I mentioned you will be shocked. It, it, it raised some of the best people in the country, but some of them came from around that community. And the beauty about church founded schools is they are not really set up just about 
the education of the best people in the country. They are set up to help the communities around them. And in part of our strategies, actually, we have that as a key component because the church insists that even when you're rebuilding a first class school, you must be able to help the community around you. And the computer lab being set up uh, in our plans is going to be accessed by the community. These are kids who would never have an opportunity to, to access a first class computer lab. Mm. But we have a plan to give them a particular day on a weekend to come in and get free lessons in that lab. Now, tell me a private school that would do that. Yeah? So it's, it's the values that we stand for at the end of the day. It's the future of our children. What do we want to do for them? Do we want to continue saying every man for himself? Because in, in trying to put these private schools around urban centers first, that's exactly what you're saying, everyone for himself. But every Ugandan deserves a good education at All the right. end of the day. Thank you very much, Tony Katamba. Yeah. Your point has been listened to and heard. Uh, you're parting short in less <coughs> than a minute. Uh, I wanted to add on what Tony is saying. You asked that why would we think we want to retain this school? Yeah. Uh, we personally, we wouldn't love to see our school going because we shall always keep on reflecting. Where did we go? Where was our primary school? Would you love your school not to be around? That is one thing. Secondly, these missionary schools were founded by, most of them by church bodies. Mm. And these church bodies were building on core values which we no longer have in the private schools. But we believe those values should be continued to help the community at large and all our children as Ugandans. But if we base on private schools, yes, they are there, they are doing well, they are getting the first grades. But even then, <coughs> me, I used to come from Kayunga Bugerere. I passed so many schools, but I was going to Matali. Even now, if Matali was doing better, or if we brought it back to its glory, I think so many students or many kids would leave the schools they are living or where they can pass and they go to Matali. Thank you very much, uh, Tony Katamba and Doris Chakua. And, you know, that is what was the discussion here about, you know, reviving the legacy of Nkoyoyo. But this should not only stop with Nkoyoyo. Go out there, you know, support a school, support a life, and, you know, become a responsible citizen. And also, do not forget to go and donate blood. The country needs your blood. Thank you very much for being a part of this show. Uh, Morning at NTV continues. Of course, Masu MTI is already here. Nakaziwe will take you further. Good morning. At your world and more. All you have to do is renew your monthly basic bouquet subscription of 18,000 shillings. Then enjoy three free days only on Star Times. Enjoy digital life.